Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslob. This is 29 in our basic application series, and this time around, in response to overwhelming demand, we're kicking off our summarizing data series. And when I say overwhelming, I mean like zero. Uh, not a single person requested this series, which to a content creator such as myself is actually pretty overwhelming, but uh, for better or for worse, um, here it is. Now, uh, most of the content here on Quantslob is geared towards developing our data science and statistical skills. And this is certainly true of this series. Uh, however, nowadays, pretty much everyone consumes statistics, data summaries, whether they be graphs or tables or just uh, numeric. So even if our main focus is not on stats and data science, understanding how popular data summaries are created is going to empower us to be more fluent consumers of news. And who knows, it may also facilitate new academic and professional opportunities for us. But uh, before we get too far underway, uh, let's check in with our previous Quantslob challenge. This is from our season three finale, counting four. So we have six available pizza toppings and we have some collection of pizzas made from these six toppings such that the proportion of pizzas containing any given topping is one. And so the question or the challenge is what does this collection of pizzas look like? Well, you know, we can take a purely linguistic approach and simply convert what we know into a statement. For example, we have a collection of pizzas where each and every pizza contains all six toppings. Now, this collection might just uh, contain uh, one pizza or two pizzas or 10 pizzas, or I suppose it could even be some imaginary or abstract collection of an infinite number of pizzas. And this statement is quite sufficient for us to summarize, summarize the distribution of number of toppings on the pizzas within this collection. Now, uh, we may most certainly calculate this distribution mathematically using our uh, good friend, uh, the binomial function. But uh, just in case we don't already know this, um, zero to the power of zero is defined as one. Okay. Onward. Summarizing data. Okay, so where do we start? Well, how about uh, what is summarizing data? And it may seem sort of silly, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning at the outset that the term summarizing data means exactly what it says. It's a generic phrase. It uh, happens to be a gerund phrase or a participle phrase, at least at the time of the making of this video. And that is to say it is not colloquial, at least not that I know of, um, as opposed to an expression like breaking bread or a uh, Breaking bad, for that matter. Okay, uh, so I'm sure you've seen uh, many examples of data summaries, but uh, nonetheless, let's uh, briefly explore a simple example. According to our data set, Major League Baseball from 2012 to 2019, inclusively, including spring training, exhibition, and postseason, pitchers have thrown a total of 6,452,250 pitches, and of these roughly 6.5 million pitches, 930,376 have been recorded as sliders. That's about 14.42% of pitches are recorded as sliders. And by the way, just so you know, some pitches were not recorded, uh, pitch types were not recorded in our data set. Now, the original raw pitch-by-pitch -pitch data is rather large. In compressed form, these raw data take up about 3.1 gigabytes of disk space. In uncompressed readable format, these raw baseball data take up about 10 times that, about 32 gigabytes. And if these data were actually printed out, like on paper, the total printed area would at least fill about uh, 1,000 large three-ring binders, which would occupy about 30 bookshelves. Or if you're a fan of Russian literature, it would be equivalent to about 1,000 copies of Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace. But the point here is that data itself is passive. It just uh, basically sits there. A data scientist or a statistician proactively applies a process that transforms, perhaps, ultimately extracts insights from data. And nowadays, computer software does the heavy lifting. And uh, of course, we all know what goes on inside of a computer. And uh, I don't want to get a rep for body shaming hamsters, but I can't help but feel our little friend here is well served by a little bit of exercise. Now, I kind of like the distillation metaphor. We start with the sour mash of information, data, and distill out salient insights. 
Now, it often happens that the first part of our process involves taking raw data and manipulating or transforming it into a common data structure, namely a data frame. And this is certainly the case with our Major League Baseball data as the raw data are made up of many thousands of individual isolated files. Our data frame can also be called stack data or broadly uh, when on disk a flat file or uh, even just, uh, just simply a data rectangle. Now each row represents our unit of observation or if we like an element. In the case of our Major League uh, Baseball data, this is a so-called game event which includes pitches. It also includes other things like pickoff attempts, player substitutions, and a few other things as well. Uh, each column here or field in our data frame refers to an attribute or if you prefer a uh, variable. So uh, let's uh, step back and lay some groundwork here. So in a very broad sense, statistical research comes in two flavors, descriptive and inferential. Descriptive statistics treats our data set as our population, and our goal is to describe what is going on within our population. If, however, on the other hand, our data is a subset of a larger population, or we're assuming it is, then we may use our data summaries to make inference to patterns within the unobserved population. And there is a very important special case of inference that involves causality. Causal inference is usually accommodated by scientific experimentation. Now, in addition to understanding these two types of statistical uh, investigations, um, description versus inference, stats and data science are often carried out in one of two investigative environments, exploratory and directed. Now, directed means that we have a specific question we'd like the data to answer. So, for example, someone may ask, uh, well, uh, what percentage of major league pitches are recorded as sliders, for example. Now, exploratory, uh, as the word suggests, is a matter of prodding our data and uh, seeing what sorts of patterns or insights we can uncover and summarize. Now, there's uh, some good news here. Whether we are performing exploratory or directed investigation doesn't usually usually affect the process we use to calculate our summaries. So that's nice. However, how we actually calculate summary statistics can in fact depend on whether or not we are describing data, performing descriptive statistics, or whether our intentions are to make inference. And the reason for this difference, and it's vexing to some, is because when we perform inference, our ultimate objective is to calculate a summary or statistic from our sample, our data set, that can serve to estimate some property of our population. And it just so happens that sometimes, sometimes the best way to do this, the most precise way, requires a small tweak in how we calculate our statistic. And uh, additionally, it should be pointed out that the symbol we use to notate our statistic may be different as well. But uh, this is not a problem, so don't even trip on this. Uh, by and large, in this series, our approach is going to be descriptive. But as we move forward, uh, we're going to offer some commentary on the calculations. Okay, it should be mentioned that with statistical significance testing, significance testing, our inference is performed in a directed investigative environment. Now, the lower right quadrant I'm showing here is where danger may lurk. Significance testing is not to be carried out in a purely exploratory environment. Doing so can lead to data dredging, which can lead to so-called hypothesis generation, resulting in p-hacking, which may ultimately contribute to the so-called reproducibility crisis. I just thought I'd mention it. Okay, now how we present our summaries is to a degree uh, limited to our imagination, or in some cases, the imagination of the audience. However, we can break down typical summaries into three broad types, graph, table, numerical. Uh, one of the most important things really to keep in mind is that all statistical summaries imply some sort of comparison. Comparison, and we're gonna see that this is obvious with distributions, but most always lurking somewhere in the imagination of the consumer of data summaries is some sort of comparison. Even when the summary is just a single numeric summary statistic. So with this in mind, uh, now it is time for our quant slob challenge. So question, when you heard that there were about six and a half million total pitches in the eight major league baseball seasons 2012 through 2019, what sort of comparison did you make in your imagination? Or uh, what sort of comparison do you think someone might make in their imagination? We're going to pick this up in part two. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob.
Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quanslob. This is 30 in our basic application series, and this time around we're in a motor on with our exhilarating summarizing data series with part two. Uh, first order of business, uh, right from the get go, let's pick up our previous Quanslob challenge. So, uh, when someone hears that there were about six and a half million total pitches in the eight major league baseball seasons, 2012 through 2019, what sort of comparison do you think they might formulate in their imagination? Well, uh, how about... Uh, very simple, but uh, surprise is often provocative, and uh, an impactful and memorable statistic is often one that runs counter to people's intuition or their prior beliefs or instinct. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and kick, uh, kick this off here. The process we apply to our data to produce our summaries is going to depend on the types of attributes we are studying. So we need to be able to distinguish attribute types. Now, this representation here may be a slight oversimplification, but it is very useful. We can broadly classify any attribute or variable as being either categorical or numerical. Now, uh, some educators like to split the numerical type into two subtypes, uh, discrete or continuous. Now, in uh, this series, we're not going to spend uh, a whole lot of time on the distinction for a couple of reasons. One is that it is somewhat unnecessary for our purposes in the short term, and the other is that the deeper meaning of continuousness is uh, actually rather involved. Uh, in uh, part five of our Quadslob series titled Continuous Quantities, we offered some detail concerning how these terms are used in the context of describing numeric attributes or sometimes misused. Okay, so as we look at this, now recall uh, that an attribute's domain is the collection or set of unique values that comprise the domain. So now before looking at a couple examples, uh, there's uh, some important things we want to keep in mind. First thing is that from a computational standpoint, it could be said that there is really only one type of attribute, and that is numerical. Uh, the second is related to the first. Uh, uh, practically speaking, I think it is much more important, and that is we can always convert or recode a categorical attribute into a numerical attribute, and vice versa. We can always convert a numerical attribute into a categorical attribute, and uh, if that's not enough, we can convert a categorical attribute into another categorical attribute, and even more, we can convert a numerical attribute into another numerical attribute. Now, the terms convert or recode are common parlance, okay? Uh, but in practice, we do not, we never overwrite or otherwise destroy the original attribute. What we do here is we simply create a new attribute, um, and uh, we're going to visit some examples in this series going forward. Okay, so what is the difference between a categorical and numerical attribute? That is, how can we differentiate these two variable types when looking at a data set? Well, a categorical attribute is one that has values that are labels, or, of course, as the name implies, categories. Uh, now, these labels are like names, uh, which is why categorical attributes are often also called nominative, nominative, like name, and they express a quality, which is why categorical attributes are also often called qualitative. So, for example, we might have Major League Baseball pitch-by-pitch -pitch data. Our unit of observation, a row in our stacked data frame, is a Major League Baseball game event. An attribute might be type of pitch. Already looked at that. Our attributes empirical domain is a set of all possible values of our attribute in our data set. And here it is. Uh, this is our domain of values, uh, our domain of pitch type categories in our data set. Or uh, our uh, data could be UFO sightings. Each record in this data set, observational unit or element, uh, happens to be a sighting. Uh, in this data set, we have an attribute shape of UFO, uh, and our uh, domain of values is categorical. These values are qualities, qualitative labels, or more simply, they're just words. Uh, okay, now, there are two things to look for when identifying a numerical or quantitative attribute, and the first uh, should be pretty obvious, and that is do the data value symbols represent numbers? Uh, and this seems pretty straightforward because of the almost universal modern use of Hindu Arabic numerals. But even still, data collectors from some countries may use a comma as a decimal separator, while others will use a point, period, a dot. Uh, and uh, moreover, there are other numeral systems in use. There are uh, traditional East Asia or Chinese numerals. There's Eastern Arabic numerals. Gujarati numerals, and there's quite a few others. 
Additionally, uh, civilizations throughout history have kept uh, tabs on things like harvests and trade. And so if we're historians or anthropologists or archaeologists, we are going to have to have comfort understanding different historical numbering systems to understand ancient data. And there's actually quite a bit of it out there. Okay, so anyway, moving forward, we're going to work with Arabic numerals with a point decimal separator. Okay, now, the second criteria to define a numerical or quantitative attribute is pretty subtle, but it is really, really important. And that is, how do these numeral values behave? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, not... Not necessarily what I was thinking of, and um, sure, I mean, some numbers like 7.3 enjoy a little uh, Alexi de Tocqueville with some cognac or Diet Dr. Pepper or uh, whatever that happens to be there. But of course, um, here, uh, the behavior we're talking about is strict mathematical comparators, less than and greater than. The essence of numerical attributes is that we may compare two examples and speak in terms of one being greater than or more than another. A convenient illustration of this involves our good friend, the number line here. Now, most people encounter the number line somewhere fairly early in their academic career. And if you're not familiar with this, our number line here contains numbers. Each number represents a point. So for any two numbers, the one that is farther to the right is bigger than the other. The numbers indwell our number line in an ordered fashion. <laughs> smaller to the left, greater to the right. To say this very technically, the real numbers are an ordered set. So, for example, here, uh, suppose we have a pitch whose start speed, its velocity is 94 miles per hour, and another whose start speed is 75 miles per hour. Now, 94 is farther to the right on the number line than 75. But here's the question. Is it natural for us to say that the first pitch is greater than the second pitch in terms of velocity? And I think that the answer here clearly is yes. If we can speak of our observational units in this way, then our attribute under question is almost certainly numerical. Another aspect of a numerical attribute, um, well, ideally, data is accompanied by context. So, for example, the units of an attribute, if there are any. Start speed here has units miles per hour. So this enables us to say that the 94 mile per hour pitch is faster, faster than the 75 mile per hour pitch, numerical. Uh, now time for uh, our exciting new segment here, our Quant Slob Challenge. So here we go. Consider the attribute country phone code. And here's a small handful of examples. What do you think, categorical or numerical? We're gonna pick this up in part three along with a lot of other exciting stuff. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is 31 in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to motor on with part three of our summarizing data series. Very first order of business here. Before we get uh, moving here with uh, today's topic, let's visit our previous installments Quant Slob Challenge. The question here is, would we consider country phone code as categorical or numerical, the attribute, country phone code? The phone codes listed here, we notice, are all numeral symbols. They're numbers. Uh, but the very first thing is I would have us note that these values uh, do not really possess easily ascribable units. Uh, I would think of these values as being unitless. But um, more to the point, the question here is, would it be natural to say, for example, Western Sahara is greater than Poland in terms of country phone code? And I would say this would be a pretty awkward statement indeed. Therefore, I would think it would be best to consider this country phone code attribute as categorical. Categorical? Okay. So for this installment, we're going to focus on common summaries for a single categorical attribute. So let's return to baseball pitch-by-pitch -pitch event data. The number of pitches recorded as sliders is a summary statistic. Specifically, it is a frequency, frequency, which is a fancy word for count. This stack can be calculated in much the way we would expect. Computer software will simply count up every occurrence where our categorical attribute pitch type equals slider. Note here uh, that frequency or count is a measure of popularity, popularity. Okay. The percent here is a relative frequency. It is a measure of popularity relative to the total number of occurrences. In our case here, pitches. It is calculated by multiplying our proportion by 100. So let's be clear here. Okay, so our attribute pitch type is categorical and we are creating numerical summaries, statistics. 
Um, by the way, this method of calculating our proportion, that is dividing the frequency of an occurrence by the total size of our collection or the total number of occurrences, is a method we use descriptively to compute our population parameter. Well, it turns out that this same general approach is a very common way to compute our sample statistic proportion for the purposes of statistical inference. Moving on. A distribution is a way of expressing the popularity of values. So when we show a distribution, whether by table or by graph or as a mathematical function, we are conveying the popularity of values. And this is true whether our attribute is categorical or numerical. Now, uh, you may be thinking, well, we just sort of did this with slider pitches. And we did, sort of. Uh, but when we show a distribution, we usually want to cover the entire domain, the entire collection of possible values, um, or at least as close to it as reasonably possible. Importantly, additionally, when we summarize data to express a distribution, we want to do this in a way that people can make sense of it so that it is intelligible to our audience. Now, in our baseball pitch by pitch data, we have an attribute handedness of pitcher. Uh, the values are labels, RHP for right-handed pitcher, LHP for left-handed pitcher. So this attribute is categorical with two categories. The domain of this attribute is a set with two elements. The label here, RHP, and the label LHP. So uh, this table here we're looking at shows a distribution of pitcher handedness. It conveys the popularity of values of our attribute. Um, we're actually showing here uh, three measures of popularity. Frequency, relative frequency as a proportion, relative frequency as a percent here towards the right. Now when we sum up the frequencies of all our categories across all our categories, in this case all two of them, we get the total number of pitches. When we sum up our proportion relative frequencies, we get one here. And when we sum up our percent relative frequencies, we get 100. Um, now, I'll point out that uh, sometimes, especially when there are many categories, the actual sum of the individual proportions and percents we may find in a table like this one here uh, may not exactly equal one and 100, respectively, because of rounding, decimal rounding. Okay, to calculate a category's proportion, we divide its frequency by the total frequency. And as I mentioned a minute ago, but it definitely bears repeating, this is uh, most always our calculation whether or not we're performing descriptive statistics, that is treating our data set as a population, or inferential statistics, that is treating our data set as a sample. Uh, okay, now, so as far as graphical representations for categorical variable, we have uh, two popular options, bar chart and pie chart. Now, a bar chart here that's shown here is probably to be preferred between the two. Um, here, specifically, we have a horizontal bar chart, and it's called horizontal bar chart for obvious reasons, uh, specifically because we, as we can see, the bars are horizontal. The length of the bars convey popularity. And I want to point out especially that the base of the plot here on the left, at the beginning of the bars, they start at zero, zero. Just as with the table, we can convert frequency into relative frequency. Here's a percent uh, by dividing the category frequencies by the total number of cases and multiplying by 100. We can uh, also, if we like, we can embellish our bar chart to explicitly show the percents of each category directly in the graph. It uh, conveys a little, a little bit more information to the audience. Now, how about the distribution of pitch type? So here, um, this table is much busier than our distribution of handedness as here. We have 16 categories as opposed to just two. Um, notice that we have placed our categories in descending order with respect to popularity. The most popular is at the top, least popular is at the bottom. Why do we do this? Well, it just uh, makes uh, comparisons, comparisons easier for the viewer. Four seam fastball at a short glance we can see is the most popular. Um, screwball is uh, very rare, but not as rare as the so-called automatic ball. Okay, so now let's uh, look at pitch type, um, the distribution as a horizontal bar chart, just like we did with handedness. Notice that we're presenting popularity's frequency and the lower limit here on the left is zero, zero. Also notice, if you will, that we're borrowing the same idea of ordering our categories most popular at the top least popular at the bottom, just like we did with our table. Now, some people, when we order categories in our bar chart in this way, uh, will call this a Pareto chart, named after Vilfredo Pareto, who was a very cosmopolitan mid-19th century scientist. Very interesting person, actually. Some people would not call this a Pareto chart because as it is presented, um, it's missing a graphical element, um, a cumulative line path. Save this for a, a later video, perhaps. In any case, I just thought I'd mention. Okay, so moving on. How about a pie chart? 
Okay, so here the totality of the circle, the pi, represents 100%. All of our categories combined. The popularity of each category is conveyed as the area or size of the respective slice slice of the pie. For this pie chart, I simply used a default theme from Keynote, and I think this looks okay. Uh, the software plotted out the percents along with the category names directly on top of the pie, as, uh, and it did a pretty good job, I think, of avoiding overplotting, uh, and it's pretty readable. However, uh, we're missing six categories here, and remember that we really should include the full domain, if it's possible, all the categories. So we can do something like this, a little trick, just move the categories off to the side and have a line or segment indicating where they are in the pie. Overplotting, by the way, refers to plotting an asset like a word or a label on top of another, making the graph hard to read. The color palette here is a little bit strange. Uh, I think it would be better if the hue of the color matched the popularity of the category. So I changed the colors to match a style guide palette. Um, maybe we can uh, add a wee bit of space between the slices to make them more distinctive. So, um, okay, I think that this sort of works. Um, I have to say I still much prefer the bar chart though. Uh, okay, another example. We also have UFO sightings data. Okay, um, some details you can find in the video description below. I should say, uh, point out that many people nowadays prefer the term UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, over UFO, but uh, we're just going to use the traditional term UFO. Our unit of observation in this data set is a sighting. We have a total of 80,332. 80,332 sightings in our data set, and we have a categorical attribute shape of UFO. Okay, now notice here specifically we have a category triangle and we have a category delta. To me, a delta is a triangle. Uh, notice we also have a category other, and we have seven categories that are very rare, uh, relatively rare anyway, at the bottom here. So what I propose is we create a new categorical attribute from this attribute in the following way. We're going to call our new attribute shape underscore Q new. Um, the two original categories, triangle and delta, we're going to combine into a category named triangle forward slash delta. Uh, we're going to combine the seven rare categories with the other category and name this new category uh, other forward slash misc. Everything else, all the other categories are going to be copied over as is. And voila, here you can see the arrows uh, show our two new collapsed categories. And I think that this is a little bit uh, cleaner, a little easier to look at. Light happens to be the most popular reported shape, which really isn't a shape at all, but I imagine uh, that's the appearance of the UFO to whoever witnessed it. Here is the distribution of our new recoded UFO shape attribute as a vertical bar chart, and you can see we have the category names uh, plotted at the bottom here along the x-axis at an angle. This is a nice trick. It allows us to make the categories readable, the labels readable, while conserving space in our plot. Okay. You know what time it is. It's time for our quant slob challenge. There. What is wrong with this pie chart? Let's try one more. What's wrong with this pie chart? <laughs> We're going to pick this up along with lots more exciting stuff upcoming in part four. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more quant slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is 32 in our basic application series. And this time around, we're going to motor on with part four of our summarizing data series. Now, we've split this particular topic um, summaries for a single numerical attribute across two videos. In this present video, we're going to show how to calculate some really important summary statistics for our numerical attribute. In the upcoming video, among uh, lots of other exciting things, we're going to use these summaries to illustrate how to construct a box plot. Box plot. So uh, before we uh, get rolling here, uh, let's visit our previous quant slob challenge. So uh, what is wrong with this pie chart? Well, a uh, pie chart shows the distribution of a categorical attribute. The sum of the percentages across all the categories, our full domain of categories should be 100. Now, uh, sometimes because of rounding, uh, the presented category percents may not sum to exactly 100. Here, the percents sum to 178. Um, perhaps the survey allowed users to select more than one option when asked, what is your biggest COVID-19 worry? Uh, but I'm really not sure what uh, really went wrong here. Uh, anyway, okay, so uh, what's the matter with this pie chart here? Uh, well, from an artistic perspective, I gotta say, I think it has some appeal. It's kind of interesting to, to look at here. But as a data summary, it is very difficult to interpret. 
uh, data summaries, statistics should be intelligible. Simple as that. Okay, so uh, moving on. Our job for this video is to show the calculation for eight statistics, and it may seem like a lot. It is not. IQR, the interquartile range, is a measure of spread. Okay, the boundaries, the boundaries for so-called potential outliers here, uh, involve the calculation of two values: a lower boundary and an upper boundary. So it's a vector of two values. So uh, let's look at uh, a super duper simple little made-up example here. We have a collection of five elements. To each element, we have recorded a numerical attribute named x. First thing we're going to do is sort these values in ascending order. Smallest goes on the left, largest on the right, and uh, lo and behold, we see we have, uh, not uh, coincidentally, the numbers uh, or the integers 1 through 5. Now, all what we're going to be doing as a heads up is going to be extremely tactical here, very task oriented. Okay. The minimum value of x in our collection is 1, the maximum is 5. The median value, median value Q2, the second quartile, is the middle value in our ordered set of values. Here, we have an odd number of values. There's five of them. Uh, three sits right in the middle. That's our median value. Notice that Q2 divides our ordered set of numbers into two sets of equal size. We have a lower set of numbers, the smaller numbers on the left here, and uh, an upper set, uh, the larger numbers uh, to the right. To calculate Q1, the first quartile for our data set, we're going to focus on the smaller numbers to the left of Q2. We're going to now ask the question, what is the quote-unquote median of this set of numbers? Here we have an even number of values. There's two of them. To find the median of an even number of ordered values, we take the average of the two centermost values. And uh, here we only have two numbers. The number is uh, 1 and 2. So the median of this set is just going to be the average of the two. 1 plus 2 divided by 2. 1 and a half. This is the first quartile in our original data set. Uh, in other words, the median of our lower set of ordered values is Q1. Okay? Q3, um, calculating uh, the third quartile, is done much in the same way, uh, but now working with the ordered uh, larger numbers to the right of our data's, original data's median value. The median of these numbers um, is Q3. Median, in quotes, Q3, 4.5. Uh, the mean, moving on here, is the arithmetic average, specifically, uh, is the sum of, the, of all of our values divided by the total number of values. And, of course, addition is commutative, so the order in which we sum our numbers does not matter. Now, uh, both the mean and Q2, the median, are measures of center. Center, and you'll notice here they happen to be the same. They're both three. The IQR, to repeat the point, is uh, a measure of spread. That is how varied or diffuse our collection of values are. Calculating the interquartile range is pretty straightforward uh, once we've already calculated Q1 and Q3. The IQR is simply the difference between the two, Q3 minus Q1. So, uh, okay, now it's time uh, for our good friend, the potential outliers boundaries. This is going to be a pair of values, okay? We're going to have a lower boundary and an upper boundary. The idea here is that if any particular observation in our data set falls outside this interval, we can regard it as a potential outlier. And notice I am using and even stressing the adjective potential, potential outlier. And I think it is a very bad idea to simply use the unqualified word outlier to describe values outside this interval. Outlier, the word can be almost something of an epithet. Uh, one person's outlier might be another person's jackpot and uh, Nassim Taleb might well testify to this. Okay, uh, the lower boundary, now here's the calculation. The lower boundary is Q1 minus one and a half times the IQR. The upper boundary is Q3 plus one and a half times the IQR. So one and a half times our IQR is four and a half. So 1.5, our first quartile, minus four and a half is negative three. Four and a half, our third quartile, plus four and a half is nine. And presto, here we go. Uh, notice here, uh, Somewhat importantly, I would say that none of our attribute values 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 fall outside this interval. Now, uh, as if that wasn't exciting enough, we're going to run through this again, albeit in fast motion or faster motion with a slight modification to our little data set. We're going to add a sixth value, the number 21 here. So let's calculate our summary statistics for this uh, little uh, made up numerical data. Minimum is the same, it's the one at the left here, but the maximum number at the far right is now 21. 
It's not five anymore, it's 21. For Q2, the median, we have an even number of observations, so there is no middle number. So we take the average of the two centermost numbers here, okay? Now, when we split our ordered collection at the median value, our smaller half contains three numbers, the middle of which is two, the middle value of our upper half of values is five. This is Q1 and Q3, respectively. Now, for our arithmetic uh, average, our values of x summed to 36, and 36 divided by 6 is 6. Now, at this point, we're going to pause. We're going to take a little break. Before we included the value of 21, the mean and the median were the same. But here, after adding an observation of 21, the mean is greater than the median. Uh, in fact, it is now even greater than the third quartile. And this fact is much worth our attention. It's very important. We're going to come back around to this. Uh, with the exception of uh, the potential outlier boundaries, what we're showing here are very popular statistics for a numerical attribute. Q1, the first quartile, Q2, the second quartile, also called the median, and Q3, the third quartile, are percentiles. These values, respectively, demarcate the 25th 50th and 75th percentiles. Now, with the exception of the 50th percentile, Q2, the median, there is really no universally accepted way of calculating percentiles. Um, what we've shown in this video up to this point is probably the most commonly accepted way of calculating the first and third quartile. Now, importantly here, if our aim is inference, that is, uh, we're viewing our data as a sample that has been realized from a greater population, and we wish to use our statistics to learn about this population, the way we have calculated or derived our mean, minimum, and maximum is commonly used to produce estimators for the respective population parameters. The situation with our quartiles or percentiles here is a, a longer story. Um, the short version is that these values, the way we have calculate the, uh, calculated them, uh, can indeed serve as estimators for the respective population parameters. Although, uh, I'm going to mention that there are more elegant and uh, much more complicated ways of estimating population percentiles from a sample. Just wanted to let you know. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, time for our, our ye olde quant slob challenge. It's a two-parter. Are there any potential outliers in this collection of values here? Two, if we create a new numerical attribute, call it y, by dividing x by 1,000, would y contain any potential outliers? We're going to explore these intriguing queries and lots more exciting stuff upcoming in part five. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslot. Greetings and welcome to another, another installment of Quantslob. This is 33 in our basic application series. And this time around, we're going to power on with part five of our exciting summarizing data series. Uh, but before we get underway, let's take a look at our previous ye olde Quantslob challenge. Two-parter. First part. Are there any potential outliers in our collection of six numerical values here? One, two, three, four, five, and 21. Well, one very direct way to get to an answer is to calculate our IQR, our interquartile range, which is Q3, our third quartile, minus Q1, our first quartile. Uh, 5 minus 2 is 3. Then we can calculate our potential outliers' lower and upper boundaries. We'll just hash through the math here. The lower boundary is Q1 minus 1.5 times our IQR. The upper boundary is Q3 plus 1.5 times our IQR. One and a half times our IQR is four and a half. Two, our first quartile minus four and a half is negative two and a half. Five, our third quartile plus four and a half is nine and a half. And so we'll uh, first uh, dutifully complete our little summary stats table here and simply observe that 21 is not contained in the interval negative 2.5 to 9.5. It is therefore a potential outlier. Part two. Suppose we create a new numerical attribute by dividing x, our original collection of six numbers, by 1,000. Well, we can uh, simply repeat the familiar ritual of creating our summary stats table and observe that 0 0.021 is greater than our upper potential outlier boundary of 0 0.0095. It turns out that multiplying or dividing numbers by any constant value so long as that value is not zero or infinite, will never change the outlier status of any value. 
Well, how do we know this? Well, there's a pretty interesting and telling way of illustrating this. So what we're going to do is we're going to place our boundary interval along with our value of 21 on the number line, the number line here. Now, when we multiply our collection of numbers by a positive number that's smaller than one, it's like we're compressing or shrinking our domain. When we multiply by a number that's greater than one, it's like we're stretching out or expanding our domain. Now, when we multiply by a negative number, it's like we're flipping our domain, like a, a, mirror, a mirror image. Notice that under these transformations, our outlier can never enter the interval, nor, for that matter, can any point in the interval ever exit it. Scaling our attribute by division or multiplication cannot change the potential outlier status of our transformed values, so long as we uh, don't scale by zero uh, infinity or uh, negative infinity. Okay, moving on. So let's make us a box plot. What do you say? Okay, so this is going to be a horizontal box plot here, and we're going to start by drawing the plotting region, plotting region, the rectangle here. We're going to place our x-axis just below, just underneath the plotting region here. Now, we need to make sure that our x-axis contains our domain of values. So we're going to go from negative 5 to 25 and place ticks, ticks here at intervals of 5. Okay, uh, let's start by drawing a sort of thick vertical line segment at the median value, Q2. That value is 3.5 here. We're going to next draw a slightly thinner vertical line segment at Q1. That's a value of 2 over here. And another at Q3. That's a value of 5. Now we can complete the box by drawing the edges, the top and the bottom, on a horizontal box plot. And so this here is our box, our fabled box from a box plot. Uh, okay, so now, moving on. The lower whisker is a shorter segment that is drawn at the smallest value of our numerical attribute that is not a potential outlier. One is our minimum value. It is not a potential outlier. Draw a whisker there. Analogously, the upper whisker uh, is drawn at the largest value that is not a potential outlier. Now, 21, our maximum value, is a potential outlier, so that means we need to draw our upper whisker at 5 here. But notice... Um, five is our third quartile, and there's already a segment we've drawn here at the top of the box, top of our box. So, in this case, we don't draw our whisker, and uh, even if we did, it's not going to affect, uh, cosmetically anyway, the appearance of our plot. So, now let's connect our lower whisker to the, the box here, just a thin segment. Okay, our last order of business, as far as the plotting region goes, is to indicate our potential outliers. And here we have one, namely the value of 21. So I say we indicate this with a little circle, and we can also use a filled little circle, or a star, or an asterisk. Pretty common. Uh, and there we have it. Pretty sweet, huh? Uh, one last thing. Uh, let's define the so-called figure region and give it a title. As someone looking at it will have a little context. So now we know the ingredients of a box plot. So I say we use what we know to examine a box plot not of our creation. Start speed in miles per hour of Major League Baseball pitches from our earlier data set. Very first thing I want to point out here is that when we look at a categorical attribute, we can treat unrecorded or missing values as a category. But with a numerical attribute, we can't do this. So instead, we simply remove pitches from our data where the start speed was not recorded. And you can see here that we have a little under 6 million pitches whose start speed is available and recorded in our data. The other thing is that with a numerical attribute, um, this particular numerical attribute has been recorded to a precision of tenths. So we have values like 83.1, 92.8, for example. So our domain is pretty crowded. And it also means that a box plot like we have here is a pretty good way to visually express our distribution. Box plot is a graphical way to show a distribution. And a distribution conveys what? Popularity of values. That's what a distribution is all about. So we can interpret this by sort of backwards engineering this plot based on what we know. Now the graph here, you can see, may not tell us the exact values of these statistics, but we can use this plot to visually approximate the values by looking at the x-axis. Q2, the second quartile, the median, is the heavy segment inside the box. Just learn that. Looking at this graph, Q2 is maybe, what do you say, like a smidge less than 90, 
call it 89 and a half. Q1, maybe 84 about. Q3 looks to be about 93 miles per hour. Minimum, I'm going to guess 45 miles per hour. Maximum here out to the far right, about 105 miles per hour. Q2, Q2 is the value that splits our list of sorted values in half. Q1 splits the lower half into half. Q3 splits the upper half into half. So let's contextualize our interpretation here. Of our almost 6 million pitches in our data set where start speed, velocity leaving the pitcher's hand, uh, was recorded, very close to half were slower than 89 and a half miles per hour. About uh, three-fourths were faster than 84 miles per hour. Uh, about half were between 84 and 93 miles per hour between Q1 and Q3. The slowest was very close to, I'd say, about 45 miles per hour. And the fastest pitch uh, was re recorded at a velocity very close to 105 miles per hour. Now, another very popular graphical way to convey the popularity of values is the histogram. Okay, So what we're going to do is we're going to borrow the same x-axis from our box plot here. Now, a histogram divides the domain into contiguous bins, each bin of equal width. So uh, let's place uh, the left edge of the leftmost bin at 40 and the right edge of this bin at 42. This bin has a width now of 2, has a width of 2 miles per hour. Notice something very important here. Since the bins along our domain have equal width and since they are contiguous against each other, the decision of where to place the two edges of any one bin determines the location, the location of all the other bins. So our histogram now places a bar over each bin. The height of the bar indicates the popularity of values within each bin. Um, in this example, we use the familiar frequency to express popularity. With a histogram, there are two other ways by which we may quantify popularity. Uh, one is relative frequency. Now here, see, the height of the bar tells us the percent of the total number of observations that are contained within each bin. Uh, the other is to quantify popularity as density. Same concept of density that one might encounter uh, when dealing with continuous distributions, by the way. Now here, the quantification of popularity is such that if we sum up the area of all the bars, they're all rectangles, of course. The sum will be 1. Now, uh, showing here, uh, this is pretty loose notation, but what we're saying is that each bar is a rectangle and has an area. The sum of all these rectangular areas is 1. Now, uh, you may be thinking a histogram looks similar to a bar chart. The first distinction is that with a bar chart, the bars are drawn over discrete categories. Here, our domain is numerical. Our bars are drawn over a portion of the number line. The other distinction, very importantly, is that the bars on a histogram are adjacent. They're contiguous, abutted against each other, whereas the bars on a bar chart have a little space or gap between them. Now, this is an admittedly light touch look at histograms. The width and location of bins is often handled automatically by the software that we use to render it, or someone used to render it. When we have a crowded domain, that is, our numerical attribute is highly granular or continuous-like, and we have many observations, like here we have well over a million, almost six million, the choice of bin locations usually doesn't have much impact on the overall shape of the histogram. So you can see here, just to illustrate, we've narrowed the bin width to one, and the overall shape looks about the same. On the other hand, when we have a small number of values of a highly discrete numerical attribute, the choice of bin location and width can have sometimes, just to note, a pretty dramatic effect on the shape of the histogram. So uh, must all the bins have the same width? Well, technically, no. Now, when expressing popularity as a density, and only, only when expressing popularity as a density, every rare once in a while we may encounter a histogram with unequal bin intervals, and this does not at all change the interpretation. The areas of the bar are still sum to one. But uh, if we're producing the histogram, I would advise against this sort of funny business. Um, just keep the bins of equal width. So uh, what happens if a value lands directly on top of the edge between two bins? Well, the software will impose some sort of rule, like uh, they call it place left or fall left, in which case the observation will be placed in the bin to the left, or analogously fall to the right into the right 
been. Uh, okay, so now before we close out, time for our super futuristic quants lob challenge. So uh, here we go. How uh, might we describe the shape of this distribution, the shape of the shaded area? Seems simple enough. Or are it? We're to take a, a look at this along with lots more exciting stuff upcoming in part six. You are definitely not going to want to miss that. And uh, that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to, you guessed it, another installment of Quantslob. This is 34 in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to motor on with part six of our exciting summarizing data series. In this installment here, we're going to focus on some ways to summarize two categorical attributes, more particularly how to convey their bivariate distribution, by two variate variable. Uh, one very important side effect of uh, summarizing a bivariate distribution is that it can help reveal the nature of the relationship between the two attributes. Uh, but before we uh, get too deep in this, um, Let's visit our previous super futuristic quant slob challenge. So, um, how might we describe the shape of this distribution? The shape of the shaded area. It's a histogram. Histogram. Well, I would start by saying that this is not something we can easily liken to something we might see in nature. Not really. I mean, it looks a little like Half Dome here in California. This photo of Half Dome, like most, was taken from the southwest, and I flipped the image so that the dome is on the left, and then I scrunched uh, the width quite a bit, maybe a little like the right side of a half pipe, uh, but I think both of these are kind of a stretch. Uh, let's try thinking a little more abstractly. How about uh, like a cartoon mountain, a mountain that is really steep and lopsided, lopsided or skewed, skewed as in skewed out towards the left. Or even more abstractly yet, we could simply say that it is asymmetrical, meaning that it doesn't look like it's mirror image. Okay, so as a fair heads up, there's a lot of moving parts in this video, so hold on to your hats, and uh, if you're not wearing a hat, make sure to hold on to something. So let us return to our major league pitch by pitch data. Uh, with total deliberation, we're gonna recode our pitch type categorical attribute. So, including the category not recorded, not recorded, pitch type was not recorded, pitch type has a total of 16 categories. Now, by the way, we can call this attribute a 16 level factor. That's just another way of saying a categorical attribute with 16 categories. So, from this, we're going to create a new attribute, a two level factor called pitch type off speed. It's two categories we're going to call heater and off speed. Uh, we were uh, we're going to intentionally remove automatic balls and not recorded here. So here's our mapping. So check it out here. Four seam fastball, cut fastball, two seam fastball, fastball, and sinker, sometimes called a sinking fastball. We're going to roll up into our new category heater, and the remainder are going to get rolled up into our new category off speed. Um, heater, uh, for aficionados, you'll already know this, is like uh, baseball slang for fastball. Now, we could simply label this new category simply fastball, but I think it is very bad practice to have the same label used more than once in the same data set. The label fastball, you can see here, is already taken in our original pitch type attribute. Okay, so, uh, let's take a look at the distribution of our new categorical attribute. I'm looking at a bar chart here. Uh, it looks like a fairly heavy preponderance of pitches in our data are heaters, about 3.8 million heaters compared to about 2.2 million off-speed pitches. Now, uh, next thing, we're going to create another two-level factor, and this time from our numerical attribute pitch start speed, or simply velocity. We're going to do this by splitting at the median value, 89.5 miles per hour. Pitches whose velocity is 89 and a half miles per hour or less, we're going to categorize as low velocity. Those whose velocity is greater than 89 and a half miles per hour, we're going to categorize as high velocity. So now let's take a look at the distribution of this new categorical attribute here. Again, a bar chart. Here are two categories we can see are almost equally popular. And uh, this should not be a surprise, as we have learned, the median value splits our collection of numerical values in half. Okay, so now for the big payoff. I know how much all of you enjoy our two-way frequency table, so here we go. 
A two-way frequency table, also known as a contingency table, shows the bivariate distribution of our new high-low velocity categorical attribute and our new heater off speed, pitch type categorical attribute. Frequency tables are, I think, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, what you see is what you get. So for example, we can see here that uh, very close to 2.9 million pitches are recorded as high velocity and, and at the same time, recorded, uh, categorized as a heater. Uh, now make note of the fact that a heavy preponderance of cases, pitches, are on the diagonal here, which is uh, what we would expect. But there are counterexamples to this. Uh, so look here, uh, over 850,000 pitches had low velocity and yet uh, are classified as heaters. Seems a little unusual. In any case, uh, for each row, we can sum up the frequencies here to obtain our row totals. And likewise, for each column, we can sum up the frequencies to obtain our column totals. The lower right cell here uh, contains the grand total, total number of cases. Now, the row and column totals here should look familiar as these are what we just uh, looked at here with our respective univariate distributions, the two bar charts we looked at. These totals, by the way, are often called marginals because, well, they're present in the margins margins of the table. Now, there's a few variations uh, that uh, of a two-way table that we can calculate here. One popular variation is called a cell proportion contingency table. To obtain cell proportions, we divide every entry in our table by the grand total. Now, one thing worth pointing out is that while these proportions are pretty easy to read, this distribution as it stands is not fully informative. And what we mean by this um, is that if someone wanted to know, for example, how many pitches were high velocity and off speed, the answer is not available. Uh, so for this reason, when we show proportions in this way, cell proportions, we should include the total number of observations. Now, our, our summarizing data mantra is comparison, and comparison is absolutely of the essence when looking at bivariate distributions. The side-by-side -side frequency bar chart, like we're showing here, is pretty effective. In this example, we've split the x-axis here on the bottom based on low velocity or high velocity, and within each of these categories now, you can see, we split our new uh, pitch type off speed or heater category. Uh, <clears throat> by using color or texture, some people just use texture, we can highlight, for example, that heater pitch types are much more prevalent among high velocity pitches and low velocity pitches. It's exactly what we would expect. Uh, we can also stack the bars like so and obtain a so-called segmented or stacked frequency bar chart. And this is also a very popular way to show the distribution of two categorical attributes. Okay, before we close out, now it's time for our Quant's Law Horror Challenge. Uh, it's a, it's a two-parter. Uh, using our imagination, how might we use pie charts to show a bivariate distribution between two categorical attributes? Second part. Our high-low velocity categorical attribute was created from a numerical attribute pitch start speed. Um, so, question, how might we convey the relationship between the off-speed heater categorical attribute we created and the original numerical pitch velocity attribute? That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant's Law. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslab. This is 35 in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to continue on with our epic summarizing data series with part seven, lucky seven. Very first order of business right from the get-go. Let's take a look at our previous Quantslab horror challenge. Uh, how might we use pie charts to show a bivariate distribution between two categorical attributes? Well, we can use side-by-side uh, -side pie charts. Uh, the chart on the left shows the distribution of off-speed or heater for pitches that are categorized as low velocity. Chart on the right here shows the distribution of off-speed or heater for pitches that are categorized as high velocity. And I think that this sort of works. Um, we can see, for example, that heaters are much more prevalent uh, among uh, high velocity pitches than they are for low velocity pitches. Now there's something really important um, happening here and we want to pay attention to it. 
we expect and even require that within any single pie chart that the percentages sum to 100. What we are in fact looking at here are conditional distributions or uh, conditional popularity if you uh, prefer. So uh, for example, considering only low velocity pitches in our data, about 28% are heaters, well about 72% are off speed. Another more conversational way of saying this might be about 28% of low velocity pitches are heaters, while well, about 72% are off speed. Symbolically here, uh, we can write our conditional proportion functions. The proportion of low velocity pitches that are heaters is about 0.28, and the proportion of low velocity pitches that are off speed is about 0.72. Okay, second part of our challenge here. Our high low velocity categorical attribute was created from a numerical attribute, pitch start speed. So a uh, question, how might we use this original numerical attribute to convey the relationship between our off speed or heater categorical attribute and pitch velocity? Well, that folks is the very topic of this present video how about that. Showing the bivariate distribution of a numerical attribute versus a categorical attribute can starkly reveal patterns from our data. Now, uh, typically in data summaries, our numerical attribute is conditioned on the categories or levels of our categorical attribute. So let's just jump right in here. Here, what we're looking at is a side-by-side -side horizontal box plot. And this is a very popular way to convey the bivariate relation between a categorical and a numerical attribute. Our heater or off-speed pitch type categorical attribute we created has two levels or categories. The original start speed, or simply the velocity attribute, is numerical in units miles per hour. So under the hood, the uh, figurative hood, we are in effect subsetting our data by the categories. So for example, we look um, only at observations where our new pitch type attribute is heater, then plot the distribution of our numerical attribute for only these observations. And it's the same deal for the other categories. And here we have one other category off speed. Very importantly, we plot these numerical distributions with respect to a common axis or domain. Here, you can see that at the bottom. So why do we do this? By orienting the box plots to a common domain, we can visually compare the distributions across the different categories here. And there's tons of fun uh, going on here, so let's look at a few highlights. Now, if um, we were viewing this in a journal article, we'd likely have a table uh, that would give relevant statistics for these two conditional distributions. But let's um, use this as an opportunity to sharpen our visual acuity here. Very first place I'd go with a plot like this is to compare the medians. The median, uh, also called the second quartile, or the uh, demarcates the 50th percentile. Um, Okay, the median is famously known as a measure of center. Center. So here, I, uh, I'd approximate that um, the median velocity among off-speed pitches is about, I don't know, 82 and a half miles per hour. For heaters, maybe 92 miles per hour, give or take a little. Uh, so we could say something like the median velocity of heaters is about 10 miles per hour faster than the median velocity of off-speed pitches. To really punctuate the difference here that we have in this particular data set, um, we could also note that the 25th percentile of heaters is still faster than the 75th percentile of off-speed pitches. Now, the IQR, the interquartile range, is a measure of spread or how diverse or varied our values are. And just approximating things visually, the IQR of velocity for off-speed pitches is maybe close to seven. The IQR for heaters is tighter, narrower, maybe about four, about. In the total distribution of velocity, or the unconditional distribution of velocity, just to harken back to this, the IQR is nine. Um, there are other measures of variability, like variance and its close kin, the standard deviation that we might traditionally use here. But the general idea that we're conveying here is really important, and that is that the variability here, in this example, in terms of IQR, of the unconditioned attribute velocity is greater than each of the two conditional IQRs. Okay, stacked histograms, same basic idea. 
Here, we use histograms to show the distribution of our numerical attribute for each category of our categorical attribute. And once again, very importantly, the distributions are rendered relative to a common axis or domain. Or we could say that the histograms are horizontally aligned. Now, uh, for the sake of this video, I want us to pay attention to uh, two things in particular. The first is that simply the distribution of velocity of pitches classified as heaters is, uh, well, farther to the right uh, than that of those classified as off-speed. Or to use more technical language, we could say that the mass, mass of the distribution of heaters velocity is farther to the right than uh, that of off-speed pitches velocity. And by mass, we're simply referring to the shaded region here in the visual, the histogram. The other property we want to recognize requires, again, that we revisit the full distribution of pitch velocity. Here's a histogram. The shape here is plainly lopsided. It is skewed, as in skewed to the left. The shapes of our two conditional distributions here are still a little left skewed, I would say, but at least visually, the skewness is not quite as pronounced. Uh, moreover, here, the contours um, of the condition distributions are a little bit more smooth or bell-shaped. Now, before we close out, it's time for our Quant's Lob Challenge. Pitch type, as originally recorded in our data, is a categorical attribute with 16 categories, or we could say that pitch type is a 16-level factor. So, question, how might we visually display the bivariate relationship between pitch velocity and this original pitch type attribute? Uh, we're going to pick this up in the next installment, along with lots more exciting stuff. You are definitely not going to want to miss that. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to another another installment of Quantslob. This is 36, lucky 36, in our basic application series. And this time around, we're going to continue on with our exciting summarizing data series with part eight. Very first piece of business uh, right from the get-go. Let's take a look at our previous Quantslob challenge. So, question. Uh, how might we visually display the bivariate relationship between pitch velocity and our original pitch type attribute? Um, well, uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to eliminate the not recorded category. Why? Well, uh, because pitch velocity is simply not available for these pitches. Now, I also suggest eliminating the automatic ball category simply because it is so sparsely represented. And it's something of a judgment call, but only 14 observations. Anyway, so to graphically display our numerical attribute pitch velocity by our categorical attribute pitch type, we show the numerical distribution given each category here. And side-by-side -side box plots are quite well suited for this. And um, this plot, uh, it may be a little busy, but I think it comes off quite nicely. I created this plot in R. And uh, notice here in this plot, I instructed the software to plot the categories in descending order, left to right, based on the conditional median value of velocity. And remember that summaries are really about comparison. And here we can easily see that four-seam fastballs are the fastest type of pitch in terms of the median value, whereas the very fun EFAS pitch is the slowest. Now, when presenting graphs like this, it is usually regarded as good practice to provide the audience with the conditional frequencies of each category. And this plot, as it stands, like I just mentioned, is kind of crowded, uh, so we may not want to further clutter it. But of course, for the sake of presentation, we can always make the tabular distribution of pitch type available here. Um, one last thing before moving on. We could also use stacked histograms to show our bivariate relationship. But especially with so many categories, the side-by-side -side box plots are to be much preferred, I think. Okay, here we go. The bivariate relationship between two numerical attributes. The graphical summary of two numerical attributes is pretty much dominated by the so-called Cartesian plot. And the idea is pretty straightforward. We have a flat surface like a sheet of paper or a, a video, which uh, we define with two perpendicular number lines, a horizontal x-axis, or abscissa, and a vertical y-axis, or ordinate. Now, any given observational unit in our data, that is a row in our data frame, will have some value of whatever numerical attribute we're calling x, and some value of whatever numerical attribute we're calling y. 
the pair of values will define some unique point in our Cartesian space here. And we can represent it uh, on our surface in some way, like a little filled circle, a dot, for example. Now, two very popular types of Cartesian plots used to summarize the bivariate relationship between numerical attributes are the scatter plot and the time series plot. Now, for the sake of an example of a scatter plot, we're going to return to our Major League Baseball data set. However, we're going to refactor or transform our data set. We're going to identify what we're going to call prolific pitchers. And we're going to uh, define a prolific pitcher as uh, someone, a pitcher, who has, over the eight years of our data set, thrown 10,000 or more pitches. And it turns out that there are 195 prolific pitchers in our data. And for the sake of clarity, okay, in our original data set, our unit of observation is a game event. In our new transformed data set, our unit of observation is a pitcher. And of, uh, of course, each big league pitcher, of course, possesses attributes like uh, weight and height. For example, weight versus height of these 195 big league pitchers. Of course, people's uh, weight fluctuates over time. Um, these attribute measures come from fairly recent biographical data on the pitchers. The terms x-axis or abscissa and y-axis or ordinate can be ambiguous. I just want to point this out. Mathematically speaking, they refer to the unique perpendicular number lines that pass through the origin. That is the point x0, y0. Abscissa and ordinate specifically uh, often refer to the actual x and y position respectively of a location or point in our space. Okay, however, uh, in the language of graphics, they commonly refer to the axes that are printed on the plot and define our plot region here. Okay, now we have weight on the y-axis, height on the x-axis. We might describe this relationship as weight versus height. Um, in social sciences and psychology, looking at this plot, we might call weight our response and height our predictor or explanatory variable. Sometimes we might call weight our outcome, but the term outcome is often thought of as being reserved for situations where we have a causal relation between X and Y. Um, although, really, the term outcome for our response, our Y value, is pretty loosely applied. In engineering circles, just to mention it, we might call weight our output and height our input, uh, but engineers are used to describing well-defined processes and well-defined processes are often causal in nature, but still, uh, like the term outcome for weight um, in our example, the terms input and output are pretty often loosely used. Okay, now, if we look closely at the height attribute, we notice that it appears that this numerical measure is recorded to the nearest inch. In other words, our domain of height values, at least as far as our data is concerned, contains only integers. And this has a consequence in terms of the quality of our scatter plot. You'll see here there are regions that appear fairly crowded, and these regions, in these regions, are plot elements. The circles here that identify the weight and height values of some pictures are over-plotted, meaning that one element either partially or fully eclipses another. And this makes it a little challenging for the viewer to get a clear sense of what's happening in these crowded regions. One way to combat this, and one way that I really prefer, is to fill our point elements and use an alpha channel. Alpha channel. And this is just a fancy way of saying to make the elements semi-transparent. And in this way, here, take a look. The darkness within a region conveys a visual sense of how heavily represented these values actually are in our data. And it, it looks like we have here, if you look carefully, a small value of height that sort of stands out from the other observations along with a fairly large value of height here to the right. So let's take a peek at the distribution of height alone. And uh, this box plot we're using here suggests that these two values are so-called potential outliers. So what is our unit of observation? A prolific picture, a person, a human being. And of course, people have names. Okay, one very important feature we look for when examining a bivariate relationship and one that is often visually conveyed with a scatter plot is trend trend, or more specifically, linear trend. And the concept of trend, I think, is uh, something most people sort of understand, but 
is maybe not necessarily so easy to describe. And one way to think about this is, um, can we place a line or a line segment through our data that describes the pattern we see? And here the answer is plainly yes. There is a positive linear trend between prolific pitchers' height and weight. Now, upcoming in the next season of Quant's Lob, season five, you're not going to want to miss that. We're going to go into more detail concerning how to calculate what we uh, often call our best trend line, which is what we're showing here in this plot. And the best trend line is the so-called least square solution, or as it is more commonly known, the regression line. Now, all the points don't fall on the line segment here, directly on the line segment. And in most real world settings, the points will be scattered vertically along our best trend line. The direction of the trend and the degree to which our points vertically cluster along our best trend line can be expressed using a single statistic known as the correlation coefficient or uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient named after Carl Pearson. Now we use lowercase r to notate a sample correlation coefficient. When referring to a correlation coefficient within a population, we uh, commonly use lowercase rho, rho, the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. Now, these values must always, always reside in the closed interval, negative one to positive one. Now, with the correlation coefficient, if we are in doubt as to whether we're viewing our data as representing a sample or a population, and these baseball data are a pretty good example of this, um, as they can naturally be thought of as a concrete population, but we can also view these data as having been realized from some superpopulation. If we're in doubt, whether it's a sample or a population, it's probably advisable to default to using lowercase r to notate our correlation coefficient. Now, here, if all the points lie directly on an upward sloping line, that is, there's no vertical scatter, our correlation coefficient will be one. If all the points lie directly on a downward sloping line, that is, the, that there is no vertical scatter here, and it's they're landing on a downward sloping line, our correlation coefficient is going to be negative one. Now, there are a couple special cases we want to be aware of. If all the points lie on the same vertical line, vertical line, which means, by the way, it implies that all the values of x are the same here, or uh, or if all the points lie on the same horizontal line, which means, of course, that all the y values are the same, this means that our correlation coefficient is undefined. It's a division by zero type thing. Okay, now I know what you're wondering here. Well, it turns out in our particular example here, the calculated correlation coefficient for weight versus height among our prolific pitchers is about a half, 0 0.49. Uh, Okay, so before we close out uh, our quant slob challenge, and this kind of requires that you've seen the previous installments in this series. We noticed two unusual values of prolific pitcher's height and a box plot revealed that these are in fact potential outliers. Now, recalling how we construct box plots and just using our visual sense, um, are there any potential outliers of our weight attribute here? We're going to pick this up uh, next time around, along with lots more exciting stuff in part nine. You are definitely not going to want to miss that. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another, another installment of Quant Slob. This is 37 in our basic application series. And this time around, we're going to continue on with our exciting summarizing data series with part nine. Now, in this installment, we're going to look at a couple special cases of numerical bivariate relationships, time series and spatial or geospatial. Uh, but first order of business, uh, let's take a look at our previous quant slob challenge. Now, last time around, we noticed two unusual values of prolific pitcher's height and a box plot uh, revealed that these are, in fact, potential outliers. Now, Question, looking at this scatter plot here, do we suppose there are any potential outliers of our weight attribute? And this is a toughie, to be sure. I would never fault anyone for not being able to reliably pick off an answer like this from the plot. But I would note uh, very simply that it appears that a large proportion of observations fall within a relatively narrow band here across the middle. And it's hard to say what proportion exactly just by looking at the graph, but perhaps one half? give or take. 
And we do know that the narrower the IQR, the interquartile range, the closer together the boundaries for potential outliers. And, uh, well, how about that? Uh, there are more potential outliers in prolific pitchers' weight than for height. Kind of interesting. Okay, moving on. Time series. Now, time series plots will be quite familiar to many people, I'm sure, uh, probably because of their popularity in e ecology, medicine, finance, and other compelling areas of interest. Just for starters here, I would advise very strongly that any serious data scientist use the following date-time format here. Four-digit year, two-digit month of year, two-digit day of month. And if we wish to include a time of day component, it goes two-digit hour in a 24-hour day, two-digit minute of hour, two-digit second of minute. And uh, we may use hyphens here, uh, like we have here, to separate our date components and colons to separate our time of day components. And we may separate date from time of day with a capital T. And voila, we got an example of ISO 8601 date time format. Now, while ISO, broadly speaking, may not be the most popular format used today, from a data perspective, it is to be regarded, uh, to be sure, as the most practical and useful. Now, of course, date time is relative, since at any moment, my date time representation will not be the same as someone across the globe. So we can use a Z, capital Z, at the end to denote an absolute time, uh, namely, here with a capital Z, coordinated universal time also known as Greenwich Mean Time. Now, it turns out that a date-time representation like we have here has two personalities, like a split personality. It can refer both to a duration of time and also a point in time. So, for example, consider uh, the date representation for February 11, 1973. And I think for most people, the natural interpretation would be that this refers to the entire day. But it may also refer to the moment the day started. Uh, midnight of February 10th. The contrast is more apparent when we include a time component. Now, typically, if we say noon on Sunday, we are referring to a point in time, like I'll meet you at such and such place at noon. However, this representation can also refer to the one hour interval of time that starts at noon. Now, a time series plot, like I uh, said earlier, can be thought of as a special case of a scatter plot. And to illustrate, here we're looking at total number of global confirmed cases of COVID-19 versus day. The time dimension is on the x-axis. Our response in this example, account or frequency, goes on the y-axis here. Um, the way this example has been plotted here, uh, notice the ticks on the x-axis, the little ticks down here, correspond to the first day of each month. Now, with a time series, we require our time observations to be evenly spaced, evenly spaced, or close to it. In this example, our time interval is one day. Now, typically, when we talk about a time series, we have no more than one observation, that is one value of y for each time value. And I say no more, no more than one, because we may have missing values, and missing values are undesirable from a, the standpoint of analysis, but they are acceptable and often unavoidable depending on how our data uh, were collected and or managed or mismanaged. Visually, a time series plot is distinguished from a scatter plot by using line segments here. See the line segments, uh, sometimes solid lines or dashed lines or dotted lines to connect the sequence of points across time. Now, notice uh, that when our response in this plot, our response values are relatively small, like we see out here over towards the left of our time series plot, there was not a lot of relative change from one time measurement to the next, one day to the next, whereas uh, when our response is relatively large, like we see over to the right of the plot, we see some pretty big jumps from one day to the next, at least comparatively. And this is actually fairly common with uh, many time series, especially when the response is frequency, like we have here. And we also see this in finance, where the response is commonly some monetary value. Now, just like with the scatter plot, one thing to look for is trend. Now, with a time series plot, our x domain is time. And so talking about trend should have a pretty natural feel to it. Basically, how is our response, in this example, global daily frequency of confirmed COVID-19 cases changing or evolving across time. 
Now, just as we mentioned, our response jitters around uh, from one day to the next, especially out towards the right here, but we can describe macro trends, macro trends, trends over longer expanses of time. So what do we see here? Well, we got a kind of a, a little upward trend through the last half of March 2020. We got kind of a leveling out here through April into the about the beginning of May. Another increase here from about the end of May through July and another leveling out during August and another upward trend during uh, September of 2020 uh, and so on. And almost as if on cue, uh, the first macro scale downward trend started uh, about at the new year, turning into 2021. Okay, moving on. Geocoordinates. Now, geocoordinates can be thought of as a special case of a bivariate numerical representation, like we said at the introduction here. Here, we're going to make use of the whole globe, planet Earth, good old terra firma. Now, one nice thing is that our Cartesian space is familiar, or we can make it familiar by indicating familiar features like lakes, oceans, uh, geopolitical boundaries. Another way to say this is that I think we pretty much all know what we're looking at here. Equally obvious is that this surface is two-dimensional, like a poster or a video. Of course, in reality, these familiar features are really etched into the surface of this grand and wonderful big blue marble planet Earth. Planet Earth is closely spherical. Not exactly, but pretty close. So question here, how can we project this 3D surface onto a flat 2D Cartesian surface? Well, let's take a look. Let's dive in here. The equator defines something close to a great circle at latitude zero. Lines of longitude here are known as meridians, and these lines run from pole to pole here. So for illustration, we're showing two meridians, 10 degrees longitude and 12 degrees longitude. So if we are on the equator and I'm at 10 degrees longitude, this is in the city of uh, Afakma in Gabon, and you're at 12 degrees longitude around the Avindo National Park area, we would be separated by about 222 kilometers or about 139 miles as the crow flies. However, if we are much farther north, uh, say at latitude 60 degrees, and I'm still at 10 uh, degrees uh, longitude, this would be west of Oslo, Norway, and you're still at 12 degrees uh, longitude, this would be east of Oslo, we would be separated by only about 89 kilometers or about 56 miles. We'd be much closer than when we were at the equator. Now, there are many, 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 many mathematical projections that cartographers and geostatisticians use to map or translate the 3D surface of the Earth onto a 2D surface. And none are perfect, to be sure. But one very simple and popular way to do this is what we've already just looked at. This is a rectangular projection. Not the most imaginative name, but it's accurate. The map distance between two meridians is the same at every latitude. In other words, a rectangular projection transforms the surface of the Earth so that the meridians are all parallel here. They don't intersect like they do on the surface of the globe of the Earth. Um, this has the effect of horizontally stretching regions that are close to the poles. And to just offer an example here, on our rectangular projection, the area of the continental U.S. appears to be about, about the same as that of Greenland, which is much farther to the north. However, on the surface of the globe, the Earth, the area of the continental U.S. is more than three and a half times greater than that of Greenland. Now, uh, we still have yet to look at an example of plotting geographical data, and we're going to leave this as part of our Quant's Law Challenge for this video into the next. Now, here we go. The ultimate source of UFO data we've looked at uh, earlier in this series is provided by the National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork. Now, uh, given the information presented here, first part here of our challenge, do you think we can plot these data on our map? And uh, the second is if we can, just using our imagination, what do we think the global distribution of UFO sightings might look like? That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslot. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslot. Uh, now, uh, I want to say that we have um, an important announcement to make, but 
We decided uh, it best to save it for the end of this video just so it won't serve as a distraction here. This is 38 in our basic application series and this time around we're going to continue on with part 10 of our exciting 11 part summarizing data series. This is the uh, penultimate installment if you will. Very first order of business let's uh, take a peek at our previous Quantslog challenge here. So considering the UFO data we looked at earlier in this series um, first part, uh, do we think we can plot these data on our map? And second uh, part, uh, if so, what uh, might the global distribution of sightings look like? Well, uh, the data provides latitude and longitude for each sighting. So we can plot these sightings as points on our rectangular projection here, just like with any old scatter plot. So let's zoom in a little bit here. Um, well, I. I think we can boil the message down pretty simply. Uh, New Fork is a U.S.-based organization, and a, a very, very heavy preponderance of sightings are in the U.S. Um, and in fact, uh, looking past that, uh, most all the sightings are in English-speaking countries. Uh, England, for sure, uh, Scotland, kind of, Ireland, and a smattering of sightings uh, in Australia's Gold Coast. Essentially, nothing out over the ocean, um, and that's not to say that there's not a lot of UFOs out there, but it takes a person to report it, and uh, not a lot of people living out over the ocean, I mean, not as a matter of common practice that I know of. Anyway, okay, moving on. Now, earlier in this series, we identified two attribute types, categorical and numerical. Now, occasionally, we may encounter a third type of attribute, an ordered categorical. Now, an ordered categorical attribute possesses a behavior that's sort of like a cross uh, between a categorical attribute and a numerical attribute. And there are typically two ways in which we might encounter an ordered categorical attribute. And the first is um, how a unit of observation placed. And second, uh, how a unit of observation, like a respondent in a survey, for example, rated something or responded to a prompt. So, for example, in a competition like a race, we may have recorded how each contestant placed first, second, third, and so on. Now, these values are clearly labels, but at the same time, we could say that first is greater than second in terms of performance. And these values, by the way, can be called ordinal rank. So now, ratings, ratings are commonly found on survey or questionnaire data. So in this example here, uh, we have a test form that is uh, gonna capture a five-level factor or a categorical attribute with uh, five categories. But like with placing in a race, we can think of the category very likely as being greater in terms of likeliness uh, than, say, somewhat likely. Um, so uh, you may be wondering, why did we not detail ordered categorical attributes earlier in this series? Well, for one thing, to really understand how these work, we first need to have a good uh, grasp of how categorical attributes behave and how numerical attributes behave. But the other thing is that for most simple data summaries, we usually treat these simply as a categorical attribute. So for example, we might use a place attribute uh, to report something like, uh, just for an example, over the last 10 seasons, football club A has finished first in their league four times. Or with a rating, uh, just to illustrate here, we might report that 100% of respondents say they are very likely to recommend Quantslob to a friend, just as an example. Uh, but when we are performing more in-depth analytics, like for example, when our goal is to make predictions or forecasts, we often, often don't make use of ordered categorical variables. So here, look, so instead of using an ordinal rank, like with a place attribute, um, we will most always prefer to use a direct measure, if it's available, certainly. Like in a race, time to finish line. Time, a numerical attribute. And uh, with survey ratings, it is very common practice to recode the ordered categories into numbers. So, for example here, very unlikely gets recoded to a 1, somewhat unlikely gets recoded to a 2, and so on. Um, and this type of recoding, by the way, uh, uh, produces a so-called Likert scale named after the social psychologist Rensis Lickert. Okay, moving on. Another topic here. Uh, let us return to two-way contingency tables. Now, two-way contingency tables are an extremely popular and effective way to show the bivariate distribution or relationship of two or between two categorical attributes. And so, to illustrate 
Here, for example, we're going to use our UFO data. What we're going to do is we're going to recode two of our original attributes. So from date of sighting, we're going to create a new attribute called the recentness. And this new attribute is going to have two categories, pre-2005 and 2005 to 2014. From the original latitude at which the sighting occurred, we're going to create a new attribute called geohemisphere. And this new attribute is going to have two categories as well, northern and southern. So um, here, let's take a look. Here is our frequency distribution. And let's just spend a moment with this just uh, to make sure we know what we're looking at here. So we have a total of 80,332 sightings in our data set. One thing that jumps out uh, pretty starkly is that a huge preponderance of sightings have occurred in the Northern Hemisphere, like almost 80 times as many, 79,247 compared with 1,085. Okay, so that's a pretty good first look, but let's dig a little deeper here. Suppose we're interested in comparing hemispheres in terms of sightings over time. Or said another way, uh, suppose we're interested in knowing if the trend in UFO sightings over time is different between the northern and southern hemispheres. Well, we can, in fact, use this frequency table to help us get to an answer. So in the Southern Hemisphere, we can see there are fewer sightings after the beginning of 2005 than before. 505 is a little less than 580. Whereas in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the opposite is true. There are more sightings after the beginning of 2005 than before. Uh, 46,973 is more than 32,274. Now, if we were to make use of a frequency segmented bar chart in hopes of helping us get to our answer, this is what we would end up with. And this is not very helpful at all. This is pretty much impossible to see the distribution of recentness for the Southern Hemisphere. This stacked bar chart is like itty bitty. It's too short. We can't really see what's going on in there. Fortunately, there is a much more natural way forward for us, and that is to use a row proportion contingency table. And how do we do this? So for each row, we divide the frequency in each cell by the corresponding row total. Now, of course, uh, needless to say, uh, nowadays, uh, computer software does all the dirty work, all the heavy lifting. Now, in the old days of stats, this would be done maybe with the aid of a hand calculator. And in the old, old days of stats, um, these computations would be done by hand. Wouldn't be too bad in this case. It's not too bad, just four divisions. Uh, but in any case, so presto. Uh, notice very importantly that our row totals are one. Also note uh, that uh, we have gotten rid of the column totals. Now, we've lost some important information by dividing out the row frequencies. So it's usually good practice to include the original row frequencies somewhere for the audience just to convey that information. Now, okay, this row proportion table makes understanding whether there is a difference in time trend uh, of sighting between the southern and northern hemispheres completely direct. We can simply compare, just for example, the two conditional proportions of 2005 and after sightings here. So look, 0 0.465 is less than 0 0.593. So the answer is, at least as far as the data set goes descriptively, we see a downward trend in recent sightings in the Southern Hemisphere compared with the Northern Hemisphere. Now, the best graphical equivalent to our nice row proportion contingency table would be a percentage stacked bar chart. The red segments indicate the conditional percentage of recent sightings. So you can see here, the red segment here, conditioned on sightings in the Southern Hemisphere is, well, shorter than that of the Northern Hemisphere. It's the same story we just told, and it, it is really that simple. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned uh, at the outset here, um, we have some uh, very important uh, and uh, unfortunate, unfortunate news. Our Quanslob sponsored Alexander Solzhenitsyn epic 10-stage beach rager scheduled for the week of April 12 has been canceled. And I, I know that this is just a huge, uh, huge disappointment. Um, some of you were planning on uh, attending and already made travel arrangements. And um, well, it was supposed to be something of a surprise, but I was planning on getting on stage three Saturday night and busting out with some sweet pop moves that I learned back in the 80s. Um, but, um, you know, all that aside, our Quantslob marketing team has been especially hard hit by this. And you can see there's a, a nice picture of them right there. And uh, 
you know, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing in the picture, but you can bet your bottom dollar it is something totally awesome. They were so excited about this sponsorship opportunity because everyone knows there is nothing that drunk party revelers enjoy more than watching statistics videos. Um, but uh, okay, so enough with the bad news. Let's move on to happier thoughts here. How about a Quantslav challenge? Nothing like a Quantslav challenge to bring our spirits back up. So now here we go. Instead of using percentage stack bar charts, um, we could also use side by side pie charts. And here's an example. I think that this works okay. Um, we can easily see the relative percent of recent sightings in the southern hemisphere is less than that in the northern hemisphere. Plus, in this example, we have the conditional percentages drawn right into the plot. So that's kind of nice. Um, for all you artists out there, I think most people would agree that pie charts are kind of nice to look at visually. Uh, for one thing, I think circles have like some aesthetic appeal. Plus, the, the name pie chart uh, makes one think of pie, and uh, most people enjoy pie. But side-by-side -side pie charts are still not typically preferred for comparisons like this because in many situations it can be very difficult to compare the relative area of the slices uh, across adjacent pies, like side-by-side. -side. So a uh, question for the challenge here is, can we think of a way to graphically combine the artistic appeal of side-by-side -side pie charts with the ease of interpretation that percentage segmented bar charts offer? Uh, hmm. More on this and so much more upcoming in our exhilarating series finale, part 11. You are definitely not going to want to miss that. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to another, another installment of Quantslob. This is 39 in our basic application series, Lucky 39. This time around, we're going to close out our exciting summarizing data series and we're going to do it in grand fashion we're going to take a look at summary tables and we're also going to take a peek at word clouds sometimes called tag clouds two uh, somewhat dissimilar topics but i think we can pull it off but before we get into all that uh, let's take a look at our previous quant slob challenge this is from part 10 of this series the previous installment so the question is when graphically conveying the conditional bivariate distribution of two categorical attributes how can we marry, marry, so to say, the ease of interpretation we find with a percentage stacked bar chart with the cosmetic appeal of side-by-side -side pie charts? Well, I have something particular in mind. So let's start with the pie chart here. Now let's add a hole, a hole. Um, and uh, we end up with the so-called donut plot. Now, uh, how it is that uh, by cutting a hole into a pie, we end up with a donut is beyond me, but that's just what this is called. Notice now we can place another donut plot showing the conditional distribution of recentness for our other hemisphere, the northern hemisphere category, concentrically inside this donut plot. And here I think it's pretty easy to compare, compare the colored regions across the two donuts. And I think it looks pretty nice. Looks nice. Uh, okay. Uh, donut plots, I think, have become pretty popular in infographics, but you don't really commonly see them too much in scholarly articles, really. Moving on, summary tables. Now, summary tables are one of the most popular ways of summarizing data, especially traditionally and with respect to scholarly publications. Now, one thing to be aware of up front is that summary tables can vary considerably in look depending on the specific analysis that was performed and, of course, the software that rendered it and also any embellishments or content the researchers added or maybe removed. But there's usually, certainly, some common themes. One is that they're typically used to show the relationship between a numerical attribute and one or two categorical attributes. So let's take a look at an example here using our Major League Baseball pitch-by-pitch -pitch data. So for each pitch, we have pitch velocity. This is the velocity of the pitch as it left the pitcher's hand. And we also have our simplified pitch type categorical attribute. It has two levels, off speed and heater. Now, somewhere in the table, usually near the top, we'll find a legend or a key that tells us the summary statistics that are included in the table cells and in what order they appear. So here in this example, uh, the first number is the number of observations. This is uh, the sample size of the particular subset. 
Um, by the way, this does not depend on velocity at all. The second is the conditional minimum. Third is the conditional mean here. Fourth is the conditional median, otherwise known as Q2. The fifth is the conditional maximum. So, for example, the number of off-speed pitches in our data set is a little more than 2.2 million. The minimum velocity of off-speed pitches is 45 miles per hour. The average velocity of off-speed pitches is close to 82.1 miles per hour, and so on. So let's uh, spice things up a little and look at velocity split by two categorical attributes, pitch type and the handedness of the pitcher that threw the pitch. Now there's a lot of stuff going on here, but it's the same basic idea. So let's look at a couple statistics here. The value here, uh, 82.52, is the average velocity in miles per hour of off-speed pitches thrown by right-handed pitchers. This value right here is uh, a little bit over a million, is the number of heaters thrown by lefties left-handed pitchers in our data. And for another example, the value here, 88.7, is the median velocity of pitches in miles per hour thrown by left-handed pitchers. So let's consider some mathematical notation while we're at it here now. Here's how we might symbolically represent the first and third values we just looked at. So first thing is let's call pitch velocity x. So uh, let's call our arithmetic average function just AVG. Our input is our collection of velocity values conditioned on the pitcher being right-handed, and also that the pitch was off speed. Same basic idea with our second example. We'll call our median function simply median, and our argument is velocity given that the pitch was thrown by a left-handed pitcher. Now, a couple comments before moving on here. Notice we're using multiple characters to represent some mathematical objects like the function and some of the variables. Mathematicians often avoid this, especially in pure mathematics. They prefer using single characters to represent their objects notationally. However, in computational math and applied math, this sort of explicit naming of objects is perfectly acceptable, very common. Moving on, word clouds, or they're sometimes called tag clouds here. So what's a word cloud? Well, a word cloud is a graphical representation of the popularity of words within a document. So let's take a few steps back here. So within the very broad science of language sits the study of natural language processing, or NLP for short. Within NLP is text analysis. Text analysis is about uncovering insights from text documents. And one simple and effective way to help in our quest to uncover insights from a text document is to examine the popularity of words within that document. Now, we have a couple examples prepared, but first thing uh, that really needs to be said here is that although word clouds may visually appear different than other graphs, um, all the same basic data concepts apply. So for example, we have a rectangle of data, right? A data frame, stack data. Here in this example, we're looking at five rows. Each row, of course, refers to a unit of observation. In this example, our unit of observation is a song, more specifically, a song by Taylor Swift, and more specifically still, one of the five most popular songs by Taylor Swift. Now, at this point, uh, I should say that our focus here on Quanslob is statistics and data science. This is not a music channel, and I know some people are quite passionate about their music. So you may disagree on the choice here of top five Taylor Swift songs, ones we're going to be using in our following example here. This list is something I obtained online and we're using it to illustrate word clouds. Okay, notice here we have an attribute, lyrics, the lyrics of the songs. Now, what type of attribute or variable is lyrics? Well, it's certainly not numerical. It is, in fact, simply a categorical attribute. Now, maybe it's maybe a little atypical compared with what data scientists routinely work with um, in that the labels that make up these categories are really long. They're very long strings of characters. So for this example, we're going to combine or have our software combine all five blocks of text, each song, the lyrics, into a single text document. Now spiritually, this is similar to how we might just copy and paste a block of text from one document into another. Now, we can pre-process, pre-process this text in a number of different ways. So commonly, we remove punctuation. We uh, may also want to convert all characters to uppercase, and it's common to remove so-called stop words. Now, these are words, often prepositions and articles, 
that are very common in spoken and written language, but are not by themselves usually regarded as important. Now, our final step is to enumerate all the unique words here. Sometimes the words are called tokens. Um, in our text document uh, here, and uh, so we're gonna count up how many times each occurs. This allows us to create a new data frame known as a word frequency matrix. Uh, it is this word frequency matrix here that our software uses to build our word cloud. Now, the software prints each word or token close together, but hopefully uh, without overplotting and possibly in varying orientation. So here you can see we got horizontal and we got some vertical words here. Um, and we plot them such that the frequency is proportional to the font size. So uh, now, for example, I appears to be the most frequent. You, me, a little less frequent, baby, less frequent still, and ooh, 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 here it makes a showing. So we've uh, come this far, let's do the same for Opeth. Uh, again, no complaints about the song selection, uh, I just got these uh, top five online. Uh, we execute the same process we previously employed, and presto, here we go. Um, pretty interesting. In a preposition that was not removed as a stop word is the most frequent word. My uh, possessive determiner is also relatively quite frequent. And of course, here, death and perdition make a showing. Now, unlike with many other types of graphs, we would not make a word cloud by hand. Um, there's plenty of software out there for this. Uh, and um, there's even some really nice online web applications available for creating word clouds. I'll put a link to one or two in the description. Now, finally, time for our quant slob challenge. Question. Uh, first, we remember the key theme we introduced way back in part one of summarizing data here. And that is that data summaries are really about facilitating comparison. Comparison. So question here, looking at these two word clouds, what differences really stand out in terms of the lyrical vocabulary between the top five songs of Opeth and the top five of Taylor Swift here? There's a lot of possible answers to this, of course. We're gonna pick this up in our Quant Slob Season 5 kicker. That's it. That's gonna do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Whee! <laughs>